So quick introduction on me. So yeah, I currently work at Trifacta. Uh, before that, I was a, on the Core Data Science team at Facebook. So I think you guys had Ta in, in last year. Yeah. Oh, last year, okay. So Ta and I were peers in that group uh, at Facebook. I was there for a couple years. Uh, and before that, I was uh, a director of data science strategy at RGA, so RGA's digital creative agency. Uh, very much, I think, in line with experiences you've had, except I lived on the agency side. Uh, and then before that, I was in a research group at Intel. So that was kind of academic industry research style work. We were pretty much looking at qualitative, quantitative research stuff. So um, feel free to ask me about any and all of that. But for most of what I'll be focusing on in terms of slide content, uh, it'll be on kind of the data prep, data wrangling problem that I'm focused on now with Trifacta. Um, so just to kind of level set a little bit on that, let me bring up uh, this deck here, and where's play? This one. Okay, so this is a pretty classic data set. Many of you have probably seen it in one form or another in classes. This is the movies data set, so uh, it has things like director and category and IMDb ratings and how many votes and uh, what the sort of rating of the movie is and so on. And this is sort of a classic example of what we would consider to be pretty good data coming in. Uh, so here you're gonna have problems like missing values. Uh, you're gonna have problems like sometimes the units are in different values. So here they have production budget in uh, what looks to be a dollars, but you'll see some values deeper in this data set where they've actually rounded it to thousands or millions and stuff like that. Uh, and this is a pretty common problem that a lot of our customers sort of deal with. They get landed a data set like this, or perhaps this is dumped out of one of their CRM systems or something like that, uh, and now they're trying to do analytics on this. So they spend quite a bit of time just cleaning it up, uh, making it complete, making it accurate, uh, such that the, the analytics they do after that uh, can be relied upon. Uh, but we deal with significantly worse stuff, so I'll kind of get into nastier, nastier stuff as, as I show you some pictures here. This is an example of a dump out of um, some telco CDR logs. So this is the kind of thing you would see coming out of um, like uh, cell towers. Uh, and what you're looking at here are, are sort of IMSI numbers. These are indicators of the cell phone that's connected. Maybe some of the routing numbers associated with that, timestamps and call types or message types. Uh, and in the cases where they're tracking the phone numbers you're connected to, what's going on. At the end here, you'll see in some cases there's a slash 11, in some cases there's nothing. That 11 is a drop type, uh, but these are the kinds of things that a lot of analysts spend time figuring out how to standardize in a data set where they get handed something like this. This is, uh, this comes out of manufacturing, so think of kind of standard Silicon Valley manufacturing, so chips or, or memory chips or stuff like that. Uh, and, and they take those pieces of silicon and they run them through many, many series of tests at different points in that manufacturing process. Uh, and then they aggregate all those tests up. And so what you're looking at here is one of these aggregated log files from a whole bunch of different tests that were run uh, on different chips. Uh, and so you get information about different categories of tests and failure percentages there. Uh, you get information about uh, sort of metadata on the set of tests that were run. Uh, you get information about indices into those chips that were tested in this pass. Uh, but all of this comes in in actually different formats in this file. And this is something that an analyst would be expected to take as a single input source uh, and turn it into something that you could then run statistics on. Uh, this is a particularly hard problem that we, we work quite a bit on. And then you have stuff like XML. So uh, it's a little bit hard to read here, but this is uh, an example of, uh, of a default swap trade uh, going on. So this is a single transaction, uh, one for the other. So in terms of pieces of information here, it's actually really one data point. Uh, but you can see how nested and hierarchical the fields are in that data point uh, and how you might have to think about flattening this structure to turn it into something that you can do analysis on. Uh, and then this is JSON. So this is Twitter data. So what I've highlighted is actually one single tweet's worth of data that's in this data set. Uh, so you get a bunch of metadata information around uh, the person who said it, how many people saw it, what time they sent it, how many reshares there were, things like that. And then it goes progressively deeper into the actual content of what they shared. Uh, they extract out hashtags and uh, named people and stuff like that. So all that stuff is sort of pulled out and structured, uh, but left in this fairly complex hierarchical data structure to sort of deal with. 
Um, so these are the kinds of data sets that we try to help uh, our customers uh, work with effectively. Uh, and I won't talk about specifically our product and how we sort of address these, although we can get into that if that makes sense. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually talk more about um, how we work with our customers to structure uh, their organizational flow around data preparation, right? So uh, everyone sort of knows you need to do this. Everyone knows it takes a lot of time, uh, but because it's sort of the dirty work of working with data, it's not something that kind of gets top line uh, addressed in workflows or resource allocation. Uh, and, and so that's kind of more where we're starting to see some shift uh, and we're also pushing for a shift for organizations to be a little bit smarter about how they manage this flow overall. So I'll, I'll talk about a sort of framework to understand that workflow, some different kind of project types laid over that, uh, and organization and roles that you'll sort of see in and around data that, that would sort of uh, come to play when you talk about data workflows and preparation. I'll talk about wrangling or preparation actions. I'll talk about kind of first order and second order versions of it, and that'll make more sense when we get in there. Um, and then some data wrangling best practices that we're kind of coaching many of our customers into. Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, I can't demo from this machine, so I won't be doing that. But, uh, but I can show you some other work uh, if we have time. So data projects have stages. Uh, and in its sort of rawest form and in its most common form, it's really at least three stages. Uh, so you talk about sort of a raw data stage. And this is generally kind of where ingestion happens. This is where you land stuff. And when you talk about, you had Mike Olson in here talking about Hadoop, the whole kind of data lake sort of mentality is predicated that uh, on the idea that you're going to land a bunch of much rawer, much nastier data into a place where people can start working with it, right? And that's really this sort of initial stage. And that moves into some form of refined stage where now the data has turned from nasty XML or JSON into tabular, columnar, you know, straight grid data that you can then run an analytics on, right? And that process is often considered the, the sort of transformation part of ETL. Uh, but what we're seeing more and more is that analysts who, who aren't data engineers, who aren't being tasked with doing ETL per se, uh, but need to do some analytics, are being pointed to this data. And they still need to get into this stage before they can really do that, right? So we're going to see this sort of progression happen. And as the data, uh, you know, as you start to see value in that data, once it's sort of refined and you have a chance to do a bunch of different analytical cuts on it, it moves into what we call the sort of production stage. And this is where you're going to see your real enterprise kind of warehouse infrastructure take that data and drive the business, right? So whether that's automatically fielding uh, customers through CRM movements or, or sort of customer touch points, or whether it's operational data that's actually doing, uh, you know, flight routing or resource rerouting on the fly, you know, that's kind of what's going to happen in that final production stage. Uh, each of these stages has a sort of core defining action. I talked about ingestion, and then of course you're going to do some data design and refinement, right? So this is really schema design. Uh, this is about laying out your data uh, in a sort of grid format that makes it most sensible for the analysis that you want to do. But in addition to sort of thinking about the fields that you're going to keep and making sure that the quality of those fields is, is sort of uh, well defined, there's a lot of granularity scoping, right? So this is where you say, maybe actually my analysis is more appropriate to do it months and I have data that's coming in daily. So now you're going to start doing aggregation roll-ups and you're going to stage your data as monthly data in this middle stage, even though what came in raw was at a different granularity. And then finally, we, we talk a lot about kind of optimizing the data very, very uh, completely for, for production use cases, right? So this is where you're driving a recommendation system that you're, you're going to just let run uh, or you're going to make, you know, whatever resource allocation decisions on the fly using these algorithms. And so you have to be very careful that the data that's actually ends up in that system is exactly what you expect it to be. Uh, and you have all the alerts and monitoring you need to catch it if something, something's not right. Uh, we often talk about two different kinds of ingestion. So there's ingesting known data. So in the sort of data lake story, uh, obviously people have been working with data for decades now. So a lot of the data they have been using are tied up in uh, mainframes, are tied up in uh, you know, enterprise warehouses, are tied up in SQL databases and stuff like that. That data is pretty well known. It's already been used by the organization, at least by someone somewhere, generally. Uh, and, and a lot of what's going on in this raw stage for that data is literally just copying it over. Uh, but it's well understood, the sort of business metadata around it, how you're going to use it, what's in there, what the quality problems are, are usually reasonably well known. 
uh, at least by someone in your organization. It's the ingesting new data where we start to see some really wonky stuff happen. And this is where you have, for example, sales organizations that are going to try and drive forecasting using weather data uh, or using social media data, right? So now they're going to ingest a Twitter feed. No one's ever in that organization spent time with Twitter data. Now they're figuring out how to stitch that into their normal data uh, and build a pipeline that they can use to, to sort of see some ROI. Uh, there's a lot of additional actions, and I'm going to kind of talk about these at the, at the highest level. Uh, really at the raw stage, and particularly for the ingestion of new data, it's about assessing what that data is. And we talk about kind of two forms of metadata. I don't know if this is common parlance uh, in the way uh, this is being taught, but technical metadata and business metadata, right? So technical metadata are things like what are the fields, what are the values that are allowed in that field? Uh, if I see something out of that range, what does it mean? Does it mean it's missing data? Does it mean it's an error? Does it mean whatever? And then the business metadata is really kind of what can you do with that? Like where does that data actually apply? Uh, can you use it in supply chain? If there's legal constraints around using data, so you think about healthcare or finance, uh, you know, there are certain data streams that, while potentially useful in other areas of the company, can't cross boundaries for whatever reason. And that's where you would sort of define that and document that. As you move into this sort of design and refine data stage, uh, this is where you see kind of what is traditionally considered kind of exploratory analytics. Uh, so two forms of that. One is kind of ad hoc reporting, right? And this is kind of traditionally like some VP in the organization says, I really want to understand why this shirt sold more last week uh, than we thought it would, right? So now you've got to dig in through a bunch of data and start to figure out what features uh, or how you might explain that, right? And it's not something you would have regularly reported on or you don't have specific metrics you're tracking for that particular item. Uh, so someone's going to do that one-off uh, analysis just to answer that question at that time. And that's a huge stream of work in most organizations. Uh, and then, of course, this is where kind of data science traditionally kicks in, right? Modeling and prediction. So uh, you're taking that data, you're doing trend analysis, you're trying to figure out if you can forecast uh, certain things that are happening in your company or perhaps predict customer churn uh, or predict the likelihood uh, uh, of a customer moving to the next stage in your sort of uh, nurturing cycle. Uh, all of that stuff would be sort of prototyped here. Uh, and then as you start to figure out that your, your models do hold some water, that you do have some predictive power, uh, that you are able to see some returns on that stuff, you're going to kick over into this kind of more optimized or production stage uh, where reporting turns regular, which means scheduled. You have dashboards that are built. They get populated automatically. Uh, and of course, now you're building products and services with those modeling and prediction pipelines that you were prototyping in the earlier stage. All right, so on top of that framework, what I want to do is talk about uh, a few different kinds uh, of projects. So uh, largely these, for us, map to different types of customers that we have. Um, so for example, we work with some organizations that are essentially data science consulting firms. Uh, and a lot of what their clients bring them in to do is simply this, right? It's, to them, it's new data, and what they're actually, the value that they're adding is a really deep dive into what the technical and business metadata around that original data source is. And they essentially are reporting back, you know, this data set that's been sitting in your mainframe for the last 20 years actually has great historical analysis on how your, uh, let's say, your pricing model is dependent on mineral values and, you know, some other country, right? So that type of analysis would, would sort of happen a lot of times by a data, design, data science consulting firm, it would la largely happen kind of in this early stage of exploring what's in that data. We have other firms that are data resellers, so uh, essentially what they'll do is buy data uh, or buy uh, or get access to government data by being sort of a, uh, a certified reseller of that data. And they'll package that up and they'll turn around and they'll either sell that data directly or they'll sell services on top of that data. So kind of a classic example would be something like a, a nation builder who, you know, what they essentially do is uh, bundle together across the U.S. and actually in, in other countries as well, voter, registered voter information, registered vote history information, uh, and make that available for people who are running campaigns. So now you know who to reach out to, who's aligned with your party, at least historically, uh, and so on. Standard reporting, uh, so this is kind of what the traditional BI specialist or analyst role would, would sort of do, um, you know, spend quite a bit of time setting up and maintaining regular reporting pipelines, so building Domo dashboards or 
Tableau dashboards and making sure that those things are regular reporting on the things that the business cares about. And then as anomalies show up there, as people ask questions to dig deeper on particular items, falling into that ad hoc reporting sort of work. Uh, analytics consulting, so this is where, uh, you know, we often see people come in and doing like deep reports on, uh, but all ad hoc, right? So the idea here is we're not going to set up your regular reporting for you, but we're going to dive deep on particular uh, aspects in your data. Uh, data science services, sometimes these things go all the way to production. So we're seeing this increasingly so with some of our customers that do data science consulting work, whereas traditionally they would either stop here uh, or here in terms of like delivering reports, uh, oftentimes now what they deliver is a fully functioning prototype uh, that is doing perhaps a, a, a throughput on prediction against their actual customer data. Uh, and in many cases, it's actually built to run in real time and it's something that they can at least put into production to, to sort of test that value. Uh, it, might, it might get rebuilt, uh, but oftentimes now what, what, you know, I mean, to this sort of point we were talking about earlier around kind of ROI of these kind of efforts, uh, just getting the reports for a lot of organizations is no longer sufficient. They actually want to see working uh, working pipelines actually driving the business in some way. Yeah. Yeah. So as someone who generally lives in the blue square, yes. sometimes in the green, a lot of times I get very frustrated when I'm doing stuff and then I find out some, some anomaly, as you said, and I go further to the green side and I see, well, we always ask ourselves, is it something in the data or is I'm seeing is really true? And then you have to go back along the steps with the Hadoop yeah. and then all the way sometimes to the, to the Splunk for the app data. Yep. And if you had someone like your company, wouldn't that be just another layer like to interpret that data? Because one of the things that actually at least it worked is we always had data scientists and people from the organization to go to yeah. and validate at each one of those steps. Yeah. So it was annoying, but it got done. Yeah. But if your services, as you said, many of the times are getting this new data and putting it in and managing, how does that process work? Yeah, so a lot of what we talk about, and this is kind of getting into the marketing speak of it, but it's like sort of this democratized access or self-service access to data, right? So it's the idea that instead of just living on this side of this stage of the staging and pipeline, you actually do start here. More and more you're going to start here, right? Which means you'll own the transformation logic from raw all the way to what you're sticking in your analytics pipeline. So now instead of having to go to someone and say, hey, the data you gave me here seems to have this weird anomaly in it. Can you schedule it in your work to check it out and get back to me? Which at best is a couple days and at worst is a couple months. Uh, now the sort of cadence of this type of work says actually, you know what, if you can just see that transformation all the way from the beginning, uh, then you can come look at it here. And what we're seeing more and more with our, our sort of more uh, organizationally mature organizations is that they actually are staffing people at different places in these pipelines but they're trying to find uh, tool chains such that you know an analyst who's working on a regular reporting pipeline doesn't have to you know jump into someone's nasty script to figure out what changed up front because the same tool that they're using to actually do the transformation for that final bit of reporting is the same tool that was used to ingest that data to begin with, right? So that sort of clarity uh, and, and sort of visibility across this entire pipeline uh, is becoming critical to that velocity of, of just being able to work with that data. All right, so jumping into some organization and role. So this is obviously cartooned out a little bit here. Uh, but in terms of sort of technical skill level uh, and orientation to the business, right? So largely speaking, you have kind of IT uh, that, that's sort of potentially a little less business oriented, being a central organization within most companies, uh, and then sort of line of business at the top here. And these are, again, kind of, so I guess it's a sort of stereotypically where you would find different roles in these organizations. I, I've obviously made hard boundaries here. The reality is this is much fuzzier than this. Uh, but you have people who work on your sort of core IT system stuff. So the guy who keeps your Hadoop cluster up and running, he's sort of buried deep generally in your IT org. Uh, and, and May oftentimes doesn't know what the line of business is, is really working on, uh, has a good sense of kind of the throughput workload that the system has to support, but not necessarily who's doing it or why. Uh, and as you kind of move up this stack, obviously you get closer to business analysts and data analysts. And I call out two different types of data scientists. I don't know if this is something that you guys have seen before. 
No? Okay, so largely speaking, you know, I bundled data scientists into type one and type two. And type one is really someone like me who comes out of more of an engineering or computer science background. So if you think about the sort of triad of skills that's traditionally associated with a data scientist being uh, some sort of coding capability or hacking skills, uh, some kind of stats or analysis capability, and then some type of domain or business expertise, out of that set, uh, you have people who come into that sort of work from different angles. So one angle in is to come in from a sort of deep coding software engineering background. Uh, and these types of data scientists are the ones that tend to get really excited about building predictive models, uh, but not just the model, but building the app that sits on top of the model, right? So they're really interested in building new experiences using kind of advanced analytics to kind of drive that experience. But they're really builders, and in many, in many organizations, these people have the title like ML engineer, uh, machine learning engineer, uh, and they can sit in engineering orgs as easily as they would sit in, say, an analytics organization. Uh, and then you have type two data scientists, and these are people who are traditionally more like quants or statisticians. So these are people who may not have as strong a coding background, potentially and often do have much stronger statistical kind of analytical background and training. Uh, and these are the ones who do things like experimental design. So you talk about like A-B testing of new ideas. The guys who really understand how to set up those A-B tests are, you know, perhaps they're social scientists by training or, or psychologists by training or, or let's say economists by training. Uh, and they sort of live uh, kind of very much in the line of business. They tend to touch less of the deep systems because this requires generally coding skills to get deeper down inside these orgs. Um, but what does this look like on top of the sort of model that I've been sort of laying out here? So you have someone like a database administrator who traditionally would own something like an ETL pipeline, right? So uh, you would have, uh, they would own ingestion, they'd own transformation, and they'd own that transformation through both this kind of exploratory stage as well as that final production stage. Uh, and then to the extent that those databases are actually driving your regular reporting and your products and services, they'll probably own those pipes as well, or at least be involved in monitoring them and keeping, keeping them up and running. Your system administrators, uh, you know, really are tend to be focused on the stuff that's driving your production stuff. Uh, although you do have your infrastructure administrators who would sort of own uh, the infrastructure that keeps this whole staged model up and running. But I'm kind of more pointing out the guys that are doing like the product and service maintenance and management. You have data architects. So their job is to really figure out what is this data you have and design those schemas such that it, they're the most efficient and best designed data for the stuff that you're doing. So the sort of canonical example would be uh, if kind of like 90% of the time people were using your customer database, they were joining it with two or three other uh, master data files to let's say normalize address or normalize customer IDs uh, or something like that. Uh, someone whose job it was to be a data architect should be monitoring that and say, well, you know what, everyone is just doing these joins. So what we should be staging in this refined data stage is that pre-join table instead of having everyone have to execute that join uh, when they start off their analysis. Uh, ETL engineers, uh, generally they tend not to touch business metadata. Very important that they touch technical metadata. So they'll often say things like, you know, the numeric values on this field are capped at these two values. Uh, we expect this field to be unique because it's a key column that we're going to use for joining later on. They would generally identify and build up business rules around how to manage that technical metadata. So in the case you did see a duplicate record, do you drop it? Do you dump it into another data file? Those are the kinds of stuff that, that these guys tend to, to figure out. Uh, type 1 data scientists really focused mostly, I think, at the end on the sort of prototyping and exploration of these products and services, uh, you know, sort of in relation to that sort of type 2 data scientist who's a little bit more focused on the deep analysis on ad hoc reporting, right? So you're going to get really deep into an attribution model around kind of the marketing impact that four or five campaigns that launched at the same time ran. Uh, generally, you're going to have someone who's got some pretty decent stats chops jumping in and doing that analysis. And then you have the sort of traditional analyst role, again, mostly focused on reporting, but traditionally or sort of increasingly so taking on this ingestion of new data. So we're seeing more and more analysts say stuff like, you know what, yeah, it's my job to monitor 
uh, how much Gatorade we sold last week uh, and how much that forecast is changing over time. But you know what? I really think there might be something with kind of social media around uh, how people are talking about uh, you know, sugary sports drinks. So maybe they'll pull in some data on that and do a quick analysis to figure that out. And more and more we're seeing analysts doing that kind of flow end to end. Um, yeah. Okay. So switching gears a little bit, I want to get in and talk about uh, data wrangling or data preparation actions. And we, we largely talk about three buckets with feedback cycles. So there's accessing the data, then there's the actual transformation and profiling of that data, and then there's the publishing of whatever it is your output is out of that process. So I say whatever your output is because it could be the data itself is your output, it could be the insights that you generate out of the analysis you did on that data, it could be uh, the script that you built to do the transformation is actually the artifact that's really your output. Uh, so there's a lot of different kinds of things that you might publish at the end of the cycle. Uh, but this is kind of, uh, at high level, the sort of set of things that happen. Yeah. I know you said data science firms, data resellers, analytics consulting, data science services, and business analysts. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, um, you know, it really only seems like business analysts is the company that has the core issue that you're looking to solve, whereas the others are kind of add-on services for companies that may face these issues or individuals. So, you know, what kind of things instigate the need for a tool like yours? And, you know, how do you kind of identify where you want to serve, whether it's like the company that actually faces the problem or you know the consulting firm that maybe is more technical. I don't know. Sure, sure, sure. So, so let me let me try to rephrase that a little bit. So you're saying the sort of analyst is the sort of core data worker, and hence obviously they have this problem. But the data science consulting, the more advanced stuff, tends to be sort of secondary concern and add-on projects, and hence may not face this problem to the same degree. Or just think about like the organization. Okay, so they've got this data issue. So they call up a data science firm, you know, we've got some budget, we want to fix this issue. And then the data science firm thinks about what tools they need to use. And then at that point they come to you. So, you know, just what's preventing the firm initially from coming to you? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, uh, good point. So I guess I would say uh, a couple things. One is, you know, we, we're most happy when we often get directly to that end user as opposed to going through intermediaries. Again, that's kind of our value proposition, the idea that everyone should be able to be involved in this data preparation process, which is so critical to making sure your analytics are correct or whatever you're doing with that data is, is what you think is actually going on. Um, uh, that said, though, we do work with a lot of, uh, you know, solution integrator kind of third-party firms. So you can think about an Accenture or a WePro or, uh, you know, some of these other um, kind of smaller boutique firms. Uh, what they often get brought in to do, and this is independent of us, is to come in and actually help build out the infrastructure. So they're often coming in through the IT part of the org to kind of manage and build out sort of a modern infrastructure to allow for the amount of data that's going to get pushed through these stages when you think about doing something like a data lake strategy and whatever. And, and it's often the case that uh, maintaining something like Hadoop is actually quite a different skill set than maintaining Oracle databases. Uh, and so you do need oftentimes consulting support, at least initially, to come in and help with that. So certainly our biggest customers work with a number of consulting firms to actually help manage their infrastructure. Uh, uh, and, and some of those consulting firms move all the way up into the business layer where they're actually helping to execute reporting pipelines or build out reporting pipelines or build out analytics or prediction pipelines and whatever. Uh, and in that case, uh, we start talking about this question of, well, are you buying our tool or is your customer buying our tool? And if you're gonna sell it through at the end of your consulting project, what does that sort of look through, uh, look like? And we spend quite a bit of time kind of, I mean, we're a young business, so we're negotiating all those boundaries currently. Um, but yeah, you know, I guess I would say that you know, we, we have found quite a bit of traction in teaching our SIs, particularly the, the more into the business problem they get and out of just the IT infrastructure problems, to learn and understand our tool, uh, because they often do a lot of kind of uh, uh, you know, promotion and training essentially for us when they go out and work with their customers, right? So we're, in some sense, doing the classic channel leverage model of, of using them to sell through, right? Yeah. Uh, 
question about this slide in particular. I, I, I feel like projects oftentimes get pretty iterative and yeah. you'll like get to the publish stage, you'll realize you want to add something else, you'll realize you have to restructure in order for that to fit in. Yes. And obviously I see you have the arrows um, yes. illustrating that, but I'm wondering if you think it's a best practice to go through the entire process with a smaller subset of data yeah. before you dive in on like a very large project. Totally, yeah, yeah. So we, uh, so I'll give you chances. That one is like from a straight data science perspective, yes. Like we spend a lot of time thinking about how to build up representative samples, and in many cases, many different kinds of samples that showcase different parts of the data. So you might have one that's just picking up rare values distributionally across columns. You might have another one that's the sort of true random sample just to pick up the average case. You might have one that deals with, you know, kind of missing values in certain columns and hone in on that. Uh, picking up all those samples allows you to do a couple things. Uh, one is actually just to see that end-to-end -end process much, much faster. Uh, and the other is oftentimes what you'll end up seeing is you'll get to the end, you'll publish it, and you'll realize, oh man, like three of my rows had some weird error and it's like breaking my whole pipeline. So now you've got to go back and find those three rows, right? So you're going to do that sampling kind of process anyways. Uh, just to clean up your pipeline and really understand what some of the rare problems are. So I think what what we're seeing is that, yeah, you, there's kind of no way around that. We actually think it's best practice. The, the hardest part there is it's hard to know up front what the best set of samples are that you should pull to drive this. So yes, in this case, you will always have an iteration. And if you think about Trifacta and what we do, we very explicitly build our whole interface around a sample of the data. Uh, allow you to swap that sample to different ones to hopefully capture all the nuance that you need to deal with. But then you'll go and you'll run the entire data set, we'll profile the results at the end, and oftentimes that will surface some issue that sends you back through this loop. And what we're trying to do operationally is, instead of having to make a couple of changes, run at scale, potentially wait tens of minutes, hours, days, to see those results and then cycle at that level, uh, is to do very fast cycles on a sample and maybe do half as many or a third as many or a quarter as many uh, big cycles through the whole data set. So that's where we're seeing some efficiency gains. And some of our customers have been very good about kind of putting that efficiency gain into numbers for them or like what they've seen. Uh, and it varies depending on what you're doing. Some data sets are just so nasty, you're basically going to end up doing full passes because there's kind of no way to clean them up. So it just sort of depends. Uh, diving deeper into this a little bit, uh, you know, kind of what's involved in these different, uh, these different actions. So finding the data, this is, for many of our customers, actually as much file management as it is things like figuring out which, you know, SQL table to pull down, right? And if you think about, like, where most of the data movement is still happening today, it's actually still Excel files, right? I mean, this is the bedrock of most analytics in most organizations. Even if the source data starts out big and in some nice clean SQL database, for the analysis people want to do, for the quick calculations, oftentimes it's much easier for them to just say, hey, you know what, give me yesterday's data, which is small enough to fit in an Excel file, and I'll do what I'm doing there, and then I'll decide if we need to go back and run it at scale. Uh, so a lot of times what we're seeing is people are, are actually managing files. Uh, obviously, database extractions is the sort of predecessor to some of that file movement. Uh, but then you get things like third party, right? So these are uh, hit people hitting FTP sites. If you think about like CPG, a huge data movement that happens there uh, are, are manufacturers asking the retailers that sell their product for data back on how, f how fast that product is moving through their different channels. Uh, and so generally, like, they'll negotiate an upfront agreement to trade data back and forth. Uh, but now you're getting third-party data from every one of the retailers you work with. So you can imagine, uh, you know, a company like Pepsi is dealing with, you know, tens, hundreds of different retailers uh, and, and trying to figure out how to normalize all of that data so they can bring it into one forecasting pipeline or something like that, right? Uh, then, of course, you have the, the sort of uh, uh, security, uh, kind of compliance, uh, regulatory aspect to all of this. So uh, for healthcare data, for financial data, for customer data, actually, in some cases, uh, you're not allowed to look at it, or certain parts of the organizations aren't allowed to look at it. So how do you actually manage those controls, particularly when you move to something like a data lake where theoretically all the data is resident in one place? Uh, and then, you know, these are sort of the core kind of transformation and profiling things that 
uh, that we focus uh, helping our users do in our, inter in our primary interface. So structuring, we talk about things like filtering out values you'll want, aggregating things up to different granularities, uh, unnesting, and this is for cases where you have like a, a hierarchical JSON structure that you want to pluck elements out of. Uh, pivoting data, right, very common in Excel, uh, not easy to do when you talk about sort of big data, Hadoop scale data. Uh, enrichment, so classically join and union, VLOOKUP, these are the kinds of operations that happen there. That's actually one of the sort of primary mechanisms that people use to do data standardization, which is sort of the, the, the foremost step in, in sort of cleaning data, right? A lot of times you have to standardize uh, the syntax of phone numbers and addresses, you know, for reporting purposes or uh, make sure all your currency is earmarked to the same currency at the same date. Uh, all these kinds of things, right, that you'll have to sort of do under the ilk of standardization. Um, and then what do you do with sort of anomalous data, right? Do you throw it out? Do you drop it? Do you replace it with kind of average values? All of these have pretty strong implications for your analytical integrity downstream. Uh, and then we spent a lot of time talking about kind of visualization of that data. So there's both the, the problem of looking at the specific values of your data, which is pretty critical and difficult when you talk about things like Hadoop uh, uh, and potentially, you know, petabytes of data. Uh, but then, of course, when you're talking about large scales of data, you have to do things like distributional statistics and summary overviews and stuff like that. So there's a certain kind of visual language as well as statistical language that's sort of required for people to wrap their heads around big data sets. Um, and then, of course, this stuff kind of at the bottom here, right? So you're delivering the data itself as your output. So maybe you're pushing it into your enterprise databases to actually drive uh, your, your engagement campaigns or something like that. Uh, or you're, uh, you know, perhaps actually just outputting the metadata, right? So this is, uh, you know, you're an analyst whose job it is to kind of monitor the data integrity of what you're getting from your third party uh, partners. Uh, you know, kind of how you manage that, how you report on that. Uh, and then finally, it might be actually the script and logic itself that you're sharing out. So maybe your job was to figure out the best way to standardize addresses for your company, right? So now you've developed this logic of how to do that. And uh, now you need to sort of publish that so that everyone is using that same set of steps when they're doing their analysis. Uh, if first order actions are really about doing the work, then second order stuff is really about doing it well. Uh, uh, and so what kind of things come up here? So now we're talking about cataloging your data sets, right? So this is stuff that is just now really, I think, becoming uh, a frontline problem for a lot of the kind of new age, big data, Hadoop stack uh, uh, world, uh, but is very common in sort of the older kind of data, enter enterprise data uh, uh, worlds. Uh, tracking data lineage and versions across stuff. So again, when someone runs an analysis and comes up with a forecast, that becomes a lawsuit because your retailer suggests you just pushed a bunch of product on them that they don't want. Uh, you know, how do you actually back up and understand kind of where the problem was? Can you source it back to the data that they gave you originally? These are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, tracking and lineage and governance are designed to help support. Uh, security policies, of course, here, here. Uh, when it comes to that logic that you generate, there's a lot of documenting and sharing and script lineage, right? So your data evolves over time. Your scripts have to sort of evolve with it. And maybe someone says, actually, you know what, I need to rerun last year's data. So how do you go back and run last year's script, right? So these are the kinds of problems that you have to solve for when you're talking about the maintenance of this stuff uh, end to end. Uh, and then publishing, right? So here you get into things like scheduling and monitoring and, and actually even forecasting problems that you know are going to come with your data. So a classic thing is to say, you know, we expect our customer growth to be whatever, 3.5% year on year. So you'd expect the number of user actions that you collect, let's say, to grow roughly at 3.5%. And let's say uh, one month that grows at like 14%. So is that an anomaly? What do you do about that, right? These are the kinds of things that would tend to get put into those publishing stacks to kind of track the value and, and integrity of the data. OK, uh, some best practices in no particular order. So. Uh, you know, we have seen generally almost all projects are going to move through this sort of raw, refined production kind of movement. Uh, uh, but what's important is actually keeping them separate. And the value for that is it is allow you to separate concerns where uh, if you do see a problem in your data, uh, you can quickly go back to your raw data stage and see if that was in your data to begin with, and hence it changed somewhere in the middle. Uh, or, you know, 
uh, you know, whether you're sort of actually the problem is in your refinement logic and, and what have you, and being able to have different places where you actually keep uh, data sets around at each of those stages allows you to do that kind of quick debugging analysis uh, in a much more fluid way. Um, obviously, you know, part and parcel to that is metadata cataloging and tracking across those different stages. Uh, you know, one thing we have seen, and this is uh, this has been quite interesting uh, to sort of deal with in actual implementations of big data stacks is how you manage temporary data space, right? So I'm an analyst, I'm taking my uh, customer interaction data set, let's say it's uh, you know, a few hundred gigabytes, uh, and I decide I'm gonna roll it up uh, uh, through some segmentation algorithm, right? Uh, and that algorithm tans it from 100 gigabytes to 50. But now I'm sitting on 50 gigabytes of data that's pretty much a copy of the original 100. I've just chewed up 50 gigabytes of my data. Now let's suppose you have a thousand analysts sitting around doing this two or three times a day. You can imagine the amount of disk space you can chew through if you're not careful. Uh, and we've actually seen many kind of clusters basically fold under the weight of a lot of people actually using them. Uh, and a lot of this comes down to you do kind of need to know when you need to keep a copy of your data across those stages and when you actually want it to be sort of allocated for temporary space uh, and destroyed, let's say a week later or 14 days later or something like that. Uh, and it's a policy that you know kind of comes with the new data stack that's a little bit different from, from some of the enterprise stuff that manages a lot of this for you because they've solved it 20, 30 years ago. Uh, data scientists should start working with clean and production data. So. Uh, Historically, data scientists have been asked to kind of go all the way back to that raw data source and, and start from there and figure everything out from sort of soup to nuts. And, and I think a lot of data scientists have built their careers on being the kind of person who could do that complete end-to-end -end development and analysis. Uh, but more and more, that stuff needs to be handled by people who are really focused on ingestion problems uh, and data quality problems and data storage and cataloging. Uh, and what you really need to do is take your data scientists uh, and apply them uh, in a much more narrow way across that, that the sort of staging pipeline. And we're seeing some organizations do this more effectively than others, and it largely has to do with scale, right? The bigger you get, the more specialized you can be. Yep. So as, as the distance between the business decision makers and the data engineers gets, gets greater with more and more layers of people in between, or in your case, maybe more and more layers of uh, intermediaries mm -hmm. uh, in between, um, doesn't that make it a more difficult um, project for the data engineers? Because it, it sounds like the data engineers really have to have a good understanding of the business logic and yeah. the business metadata and you know, what, what the data is going to be used for yeah. in order to make all these, these, these decisions around the uh, Yeah, for sure. So around. what we're seeing actually is, is emerging as a practice where you essentially get kind of a peer programming model. So the analyst or, or let's say the business manager who really understands the business implications of what they're trying to get out of that data will sit down and work with the data engineers to actually scope out what they're doing. Now historically this was a super painful process and we have some cartoon slides of this that we use in our sales decks which is basically you know the analyst goes to the IT guy and says hey I need to see this data set and he goes well I can't give you the whole thing so what do you want to see and he goes well I don't know what I want to see it until I see the data set. Well I can't show you the data set until you tell me what you want out of it and around and around and around and what we're looking at with our product and our competitors are looking at uh, is building interfaces that are accessible to an analyst, a business manager, uh, to the point where, okay, maybe they won't get 100% right, but they're gonna get 80 or 90% there with what they can do in the product. Uh, and then they can sit down and have a much more concrete conversation with a data engineer about exactly what needs to go into that final schema that they publish. Uh, and so we've had customers kind of come back and say, you know what, like, yes, we know that your product can actually execute this transformation logic for us at scale, but really the value is, is as an artifact to have this conversation between the business manager and the ETL engineer who's going to go back and rewrite this in our own sort of native ETL language anyways. Um, but that sort of shared artifact capacity of some of these newer self-service data prep tools uh, is actually what we're seeing actually drive a lot of value. And it is to the point of like collapsing those intermediaries in, at least in conversation, right? I mean, in terms of actual layers of work, they might still be there, but at least the communication lines can be cleared using a shared artifact. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think I might skip the rest of those. Uh, and 
given that we're almost out of time, just open up for general questions, or I can show you some other project work or whatever. What yeah. pays for that value what's that? that you create between the business analyst and the data engineer? Like who, what's the bit, like who says, yes, I'll write a check for our budget product cost for that? Good question. So, you know, we see this coming out at two angles. Generally, it is the line of business who is most acutely upset about not being able to move faster with their data. Uh, and they'll try a couple different paths traditionally. So one is they'll try to buy tooling that literally bypasses IT, which generally doesn't really work. Uh, but they're the ones who will put dollars behind a product that allows you to speed up their, their side of it. Now, IT in many cases will push back and say, we don't want self-surface access. We don't want everyone just jumping in the cluster and doing what they want. So oftentimes the sell there is basically like, look, well, we know that you're, you're capacity constrained. We know that you have a backlog of 40, 50, 100, 300 requests for data polls or aggregation analyses that no one else can run except for you because no one else has access. Uh, and you're sitting there saying it's going to be three months for someone to get a request back. Uh, and so you basically talk to them about freeing up capacity by doing this. But it is a very kind of nuanced conversation around kind of government governance and control and how you kind of manage that. Uh, but generally, dollars move faster out of the line of business for this stuff because like they're willing to throw money at their pain, whereas IT will almost always try to build their way out of their pain. Not always, but generically, yeah. What's the minimum size of this problem kind of manifests if you're I mean, yeah, we've seen, we've actually sold to, to startups or in some cases sort of worked with them as partners to kind of give them the product to get like feedback on it. Uh, but, you know, we've kind of the smallest real production organizations, like small financial firms that are, let's say, managing a small portfolio. You got one analyst in that organization who looks at all the data and he's kind of just slammed under 30 or 40 ginormous Excel spreadsheets and can only do top level aggregates at sort of month level stuff because it's the only level he can kind of work with. Uh, so one guy essentially is, is going to pay to buy a product that gives him the capacity to do a deeper level analysis. Um, but generally what we see is more small groups. So we'll see like a group of five to ten analysts who collectively own some reporting pipeline. So let's say CPG, you know, you're the CPFR, so you manage like forecasting across a number of different product lines and a number of different retailers collectively as a group. We'll look at one tool such that shared logic across the different retailers and the cost of the different data sets that they use can be shared more easily between them, right? I mean, otherwise you're copying macros out of Excel books, workbooks and stuff like this. All right, great. Thanks, Ty.